I said in our last programme that perhaps the actor's most difficult problem was in handling soliloquies. Well, I was wrong. There's something more difficult, and that's how to handle irony. It may sound surprising to give a whole programme over to irony, but Shakespeare uses it over and over. But today we're not very good at irony. Most of us use it rarely, if at all. I suppose the best people at handling irony in Shakespeare that I've ever come across has been New York drama students, and particularly black students. And that's because irony is part of their natural idiom. They use it daily, but we don't. Sardonic humour, maybe, sending up, certainly, but irony, not very oft. Perhaps we'd be even pushed to say what irony is. I suppose the simplest way of defining it is something like this. It's saying one thing while meaning something else, which is opposite to its surface meaning. It's commonly humorous, but it may at the same time be deadly serious. The speaker enjoys it, sometimes wryly at his own expense. One of the reasons that it's difficult is that it's often halfway between thought and feeling. Basic emotions like joy and hate and fear and greed and joy come easily to us. Any actor knows what they mean, and he can tap them somewhere inside himself. But irony, if I say, play it ironically, what do all of you feel? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what to do? And what you've said, you, you've, I mean, what you've said is very clear. The, the difficulty about uh, irony is that it doesn't leap off the page. You no. cannot write ironically. Uh, the words on the page hold, hold either one meaning or another. It, it, you cannot... I mean, this is, this is why it's so dangerous to give an ironic answer to, to a question that an interviewer right. asks you. A you, word you, on a page you, is one word. You cannot write ironically. The but actor has to interpret yes. ironically. But what Shakespeare does is writes down one word or group of words, yeah. which are, as you say, one set of words, mm. yeah. but there and are two meanings to it. That's yes, right. Yes. So which you have made very clear, yes. I mean, yes. the word I haven't used, which obviously comes up in this programme, is ambiguity yeah. as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's the double meaning. Mm. So that's what we've got to dig into and see if we can find it. I think that perhaps one of the key points is this. Irony involves the speaker in being at once inside and outside the situation in which he finds himself. Perhaps that's helpful as well. But do we know how to play it? Well, we'll clearly have to get the right intention again, won't we? That's crucial for leading into it, mm. I think. But a certain special tone is involved. That's what we're going to find hard to define, I think, then. It's, and so we'll look at some examples, both simple and more complex, and some even hidden irony. So let's have a go now. Let's clear and start our exploration. First, listen to Mark Antony in the forum in Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
Good. Now, I think that prompts me to say two things about irony that could go further, because oh, no. you were... You were pointing it out, but two way, in two ways it could go further. Some, one, sometimes we define irony by putting words in inverted commas or saying they have capital letters. Mm -hmm. So I could say to you, give Brutus capital letters and put the honourable man more into inverted commas. OK. And the other element of the irony is what goes on in the eyes, isn't it? Because yes. irony, meaning one thing, but saying, saying something else, two meanings, yes. comes over if your eyes are equivocal about what you're saying. So yes, why don't we just do the, the two lines, but Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable yes, man. Yes, right. But Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. Noble and very clear piece of oh, irony. Oh, thank you. You can get down. Thank you. Well, that's a broad and obvious example. The irony is as overt as Antony dares to make it. But sometimes Shakespeare's characters are more subtle with their irony. When Richard II looks at his face in a mirror, he says to Bolingbroke, who has deposed him, A brittle glory shineth in this face. As brittle as the glory is the face. For there it is, cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed. My face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. The shadow of my sorrow? Let's see. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. This is both ironic and ambiguous. The situation seems to be about the grief and the emotions of the king, but those are the key lines. I think that what Bolingbroke really means here goes to the very heart of Richard II's nature. I believe that Richard is a player king in the sense that he plays at kingship and his emotions are often more emotional indulgences which make a kind of play out of the reality around him. He turns the situation he finds himself in into a cue for emotional and dramatic display. And he does so here and Bolingbroke catches him at it. Breaking the mirror and saying, mark how my sorrow has destroyed my face is a dramatic and striking gesture but Bolingbroke really, really sees through it. So the shadow of your sorrow really means the unreality of your sorrow. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face, i.e. your false sorrow has merely destroyed your false playerly face. In other words, Bolingbroke is telling Richard that his sorrow is as unreal as the rest of his public persona. Well, Dickie, you played this famously many years ago. How does that passage strike you coming back to it? I think that the way I try to interpret Richard, he, the tragedy was that he never actually discovered himself, even in moments like this. He doesn't really understand. He's, he's in a state of almost perpetual bewilderment, and I think this is, his, this is his tragedy. In the very beginning of the play, in the first few scenes of the play, when we concentrated very much on, the, as you're saying, the player king, the show-off, the demonstrator, the sort of dandy-like, sometimes played homosexual uh, king, which I think is wrong, but um, the, 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 certainly the show-off king. Um, and there are glimpses of his search for himself and his internal reality perhaps as early on as the return from Ireland. 
But of course, there are moments when the king has that self-knowledge and yes. he's ironic about himself, which we'll yes. look at a bit later in the program. Yes. Yes. It's an unfair test to just yes. ask you to do that one bit. Yes, yes but, I just wonder, well, I mean, I don't really think that what the little sequence we've just done, I wouldn't describe it as an, um, is as, as a, an example of either irony or ambiguity. I mean, Not the sequence isn't, but no. your remark is, I think. Well, not altogether, John. I mean, isn't, isn't it rather more saying it's not... If you're being ironical, then you're being disingenuous and saying something meaning the reverse of what you say. In this particular case, it's nearer to gentle sarcasm, actually, than to irony, I think. Why I think it's irony is I think it does have the double meaning of irony because, to him, the remark seems to be a sympathetic remark of his state, and he takes the surface meaning, but actually you mean something else, and that's why you're making an ironic joke, because you know he won't understand you, because well, he's well, so... Well, in that case, I did it wrong, because then I should, <laughs> I should, I should, I should have played it... Where does, where does um, sarcasm end, where does irony begin? Less sarcastically, then. I mean, I didn't play irony then, I played um, gentle sarcasm. Let's, let's stick to this one point, because yep. it is irony, because you are saying a surface thing which he thinks he understands, but you're really saying a criticism of him which he doesn't understand. Well, then I should have said it as a surface thing. Well, I think we should round it off by doing it again. The other way. It'll probably come well, out the same. Well, irony and ambiguity, you've got to play both meanings, haven't you? Right, try again. Yeah. <clears throat> For there it is. Cracked in an hundred shillings. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. You've got it. Yeah. I'd give it to Mark. Again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, what's, what's come out of this, of course, is always, as soon as we go into irony, this conversation comes up, which Dawn. is how much is it overt and how much yeah. is it hidden? And I think this is a very good example of where it's got yeah. to be both at once. OK, good. Here's a particularly tricky sonnet. It's full of irony, but the irony isn't apparent at first. It is, amongst other things, a terrific exercise in our old friend's antithesis and stressing the key words. If you don't place and stress them, the speech will be incomprehensible. Let's see what happens if, first of all, you do the speech unstressed and then see how we make it clearer by the stressing. OK? Great. Those parts of thee that the world's eye doth view want nothing that the thought of hearts can mend all tongues, the voice of souls, give thee that due, uttering bare truth, even so as foes commend. OK, point made. Unstressed, it's totally gibberish, totally impossible to follow. Now start going for the stresses and the antithetical words. Those parts of thee that the world's eye doth view want nothing that the thought of hearts can mend. All tongues... The voice of souls give thee that due, uttering bare truth, even so as foes commend. OK, that's stage, tr stage two. You're making it clear now to us, and we can go with the argument. But now let's bring in the irony, because it wasn't clear what the speaker was actually doing. And remember that you're mocking somebody. So play it more to Ben and send him up. OK. Those parts of thee that the world's eye doth view want nothing that the thought of hearts can mend. All tongues, the voice of souls, give thee that due, uttering bare truth, even so as foes commend. Thy outward thus with outward praise is crowned. But those same tongues that give thee so thine own, in other accents do thy praise confound by seeing farther than the eye has shown. They look into the beauty of thy mind, and that in guess they measure by thy deeds, then churls their thoughts, although their eyes were kind, to thy fair flower 
at the rank smell of weeds. But why thy odour matcheth not thy show, the soil is this, that thou dost common grow. Great, good. Now, let's dig one thing further. Just take that last couplet and dig more into not only the irony, but the ambiguity about what you mean by the soil and the common, because you mean soil... Sexual ambiguity. Well, right? soil means the earth and common means a common land, but soil also means sexually soiled and common is Vulgar. sexually common. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Just those two lines. But why thy odour matcheth not thy show, the soil is this, that thou dost common grow. Yes, good. Now, how, how does the actor capture that double meaning? By putting the words into inverted commas, underlining them. It's, again, one of our main points about text, isn't it? Do you have to put them into italics? The to, antithesis. To, well, it's not the antithesis, just as it's the ambiguities of saying, hey, folks, there's a double meaning here. Oh, I mean yes. two things. And the irony, again, is to do with meaning more than you seem to say on the surface. So you signal to the audience, in to. a way... You have that to you have to there. play with the word to get the information to the audience. So that the audience has to be an active listener, not a passive listener, because if you are serving them with ambiguous words, they cannot sit there and passively listen, and therefore they are involved. That's right. So even though she's playing the speech to somebody, she's actually got to be sharing it with the mm. audience, not just with you. Mm. Mm. Let's let's now go on to an easier sonnet that makes the same point, Ben, and you do when my love swears. Because it's, it's the same thing, it's an ironic sonnet, but in this time it's a bit easier and it's a different situation because you're talking to an audience, you're not actually talking to your love, you're talking about your love. Mm. Easier, this one is easier. Is I think this one is easier, I think so too. This is, this is an easier sonnet. <laughs> Just listen to this, wait for it, wait for it. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. That she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties, thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best. Simply I credit her false speaking tongue on both sides, thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? All oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. And age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her. <laughs> and she with me, <laughs> and in our faults by lies we flattered be. Good. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed that. That was very, very good. See, I, all our old points come up, don't they? I mean, antithesis comes up again, like when she swears she's made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. And the point I'm making in this program about ambiguity comes up, because... There's a number of things that mean two things in that speech, aren't there? Like vainly thinking yeah. and uttering bare truth. Mm. I thought that you warmed up as you went on, but perhaps in those early ones you could have played with the words a bit more daringly mm. still. Mm. Yes, you're quite right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's very good, though. It's made the point. Thank good. you. Lovely. Let's take another sonnet which is rich in ambiguity and double meanings. But first of all, it's a terrific exercise in antithesis. So Norman, start by going for the meaning and for all the key antitheses. You're discussing your sex life with your mistress. Oh, that's what it's about, is it? <laughs> <laughs> nice to know that. Love is too young to know what conscience is. Yet who knows not, conscience is born of love. Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amiss, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. For thou betraying me, I do betray my nobler part to my gross body's treason. My soul doth tell my body that he may triumph in love, 
flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. <laughs> Good. Good start. Now, what you did there was to play the surface meanings very clearly. So now, having got the antitheses, let's feed in one crucial piece of information which affects the meaning of the whole sonnet and the whole tone of it. Conscience here is ambiguous. The Elizabethans used it not only in the moral sense, as we do, but also in the sense of carnal knowledge. So do it again, and from the outset, bring out all the sexual innuendos that are in the text, to stand in thy affairs and so on. Mock both your mistress and yourself. Love is too young to know what conscience is. Yet who knows not? Conscience is born of love. Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amiss, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. For thou betraying me, I do betray my nobler part to my gross body's treason. My soul doth tell my body that he may triumph in love. Flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love for whose dear love I rise and fall. Very rich in ambiguity. Now, this is very tricky verbally, which is why I want to unravel it one by one. We've got the antithesis, we've got the double meanings pretty yep. clear. But now, let's take it one step further. As I think the thing we haven't brought out yet is the irony. Mock yourself for being more your mistress's sexual slave. And this time, share your thoughts with your audience as much as with her. So be outrageous, go as far as you can in relishing the ironic and ambiguous words. Take it a bit quicker. Right. <coughs> <coughs> Love is too young to know what conscience is. Yet who knows not? Conscience is born of love. Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amiss, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. For thou betraying me, I do betray my nobler part to my gross body's treason. My soul doth tell my body that he may triumph in love. Flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. Good. Very ambiguous, very ironic. Now, I want to make a digression. What about the rhymes in these sonnets, and indeed the many rhyming couplets in the plays themselves? We haven't talked about them, but what should an actor do about them? Should he play them, or should he ignore them? Well, I'm sure that he should play them because they're there in the text. To dodge them is a cop-out and a textual distortion. They need to be relished consciously. So the actor needs, as it were, to make the rhyme up himself and to coin it deliberately, perhaps to show off or to score or stress a point, 
or to round something off as happens with the end of this sonnet. I think if there's any rule here, it's the same as with heightened language. After all, rhyme is a form of heightened language, so it must be found. Well, I suppose we'd agree that though we're clear about the nature of irony, it still doesn't necessarily enable us always to communicate it. An actor can't just say or even stress the words, he clearly has to do something with them. Norman was using, relishing, savouring the words. Well, the most practical tip I can offer, therefore, about irony is to repeat and stress what I've briefly said already. The actor must, as it were, put the word in inverted commas or give it a capital letter, or both. That's what we've actually been doing, I think. Brutus is an honourable man, inverted commas. Brutus is an honourable man, capital letters. Well, of course, I'm exaggerating, but I think our point does hold. So let's look now at a very familiar speech which brings this out very strongly. King Richard II has heard his land is in arms against him, and so he laments his downfall. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown and rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humid thus comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. Farewell, King. Good. Now, what I'm going to push is the element of the self-mockery. <coughs> see if we take it even further as far as we can go. Mm -hmm. I think to set the whole thing up, for God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. You should say to the audience, this is going to be great telling this story of the death of kings. I think if you get that trigger into the speech, you're away for it. But if you go totally into your grief for death of kings, yeah. the idea of you standing outside yourself yes, and luxuriating in yes. a situation yeah. that just, yes. just to go for that one line. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. That's right. It's delicious. It's going to be glorious. We're going to have fun. Interesting five minutes. <laughs> now, skip on a few lines and come to the, the famous lines within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king. Your enjoyment of discovering that the crown is hollow, not the grief of the crown's weight and yeah. greatness, yeah. Yeah. but this crown yeah. is hollow and yeah. I'm enjoying the discovery. And rounding the mortal temples of a king, yes. Yes. the realisation that you're mortal, don't yeah. play it for the woe of it, but enjoy mocking yourself. That little bit. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp. That's from Arbus. Allowing yeah. him. Makes yeah. no end of difference. See, it? that line, scoffing his state, death, scoffing your state and grinning, grinning at your pomp, is the clue, in a way, to the yeah. speech. Yes. Because death is mocking you, you yes. realise it, yes. and you enjoy laughing yes. at yourself. Yes. Why don't you try it through yes. again? Yes. Having latched onto this particular yes. thing that we're going for, now actually take it a bit quicker, because you'll actually yes. enjoy it more. Yes. Right. OK? Right. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. 
how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. There the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humored thus, comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. And farewell, king. Good. Now, I think that what you showed beautifully there was something that I touched on earlier. You managed to both be inside the character and yet to stand outside yourself and at the same you, time. And it's that double thing which yeah. is, to me, the heart of yeah. irony. Yeah. And it's very difficult to do both at once, yeah. but I thought you did fully. Would, would, you, would you define the difference in, in, when, you do, when you're directing an actor, when you say, be more wry? Do you link the wryness with the irony? Is it the same thing, or is there a, a tidge of difference between irony and wryness? Well, wryness is simpler, isn't it? It's what we say is do it with wry humour, and that's the note about the humour. Irony is about this double vision, which very often has humour in it, yes. but is more difficult. Yes. But it's the double vision. It's the double vision. Good. I realise we've strayed here beyond something which is demonstrably and objectively present in the text to something much more subjective. So often with Shakespeare, it's at first sight arguable whether irony is there at all. And it's particularly easy to overlook it in Shakespeare's political plays. Yet over and over, he gives his politician bits of hidden irony as part of their political persona. They have a surface urbanity, an inner malice or bitterness. But it's very easy for an actor to overlook it. Let's take one very simple example. In King Henry IV, part one, the rebel Worcester comes to a parley and talks to the king. I protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it. How comes it then? It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. And yet I must remember you, my lord. Okay, we would hold it there. Let's ask ourselves, why there's that little superfluous my lord in the third line? Because there's been a your majesty in the first line. And Shakespeare doesn't usually pad out a line. And clearly I think both your majesty and my lord are ironic because you're reminding him that he's a usurper and not really a lord. So yeah, do it in Really a lord yeah. rather than a king. Well, yes, it, yes. It, it's, either, it's either they're both ironic or the one's right and the other's wrong, isn't it? I don't That's know, right. they're set against each other anyway. That's right. He, he, he thinks he's his majesty, just, yeah, but right. you don't. Uh, yes. He's All right, good, well, let's try and see if we can <laughs> get all that out of two words. Yes, okay. Right. <laughs> um, once again. I protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it. How comes it then? It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house, and yet I must remember you, my lord. Good, very ironic, very clear. Very ironic, very <laughs> ironic. Very ironic. Very ironic. <laughs> it's the little words of irony that are often the easy ones to overlook, but that was very well placed. <laughs> Got that, good. So let's look at another problem. What happens when a character hides his irony from the person he's speaking to, but has obliquely to reveal it to the audience? When his mother persuades Coriolanus to desert the Volscians and spare Rome, the Volscian leader, Tullus Orphidius, says nothing for nearly 200 lines. But when Coriolanus finally addresses him, he just says four words. Here, is Coriolanus talking to his mother? 
Oh, my mother. Mother, oh. You have won a happy victory to Rome. But for your son, believe it, oh, believe it. Most dangerously you have with him prevailed. If not most mortal to him. But let it come. Ophidius, though I cannot make true wars, I'll frame convenient peace. Now, good Ophidius, were you in my stead, would you have heard a mother less? Or granted less? Ophidius! I was moved with all. Good. Ophidius' reply is so brief, it's hard to be certain of his intention. Clearly, it's very ambiguous. He was moved, but he puts it dryly and stands outside his own emotion, as Ben did. The whole content of the scene tells us that he's thinking about the implications of Coriolanus's portrayal. So here, the surface meaning is true, but Ben caught the underneath ironic under-meaning which contradicts it. I was moved with all. I thought that was wonderful. I wouldn't say anything more about it. Thank you should goodness. be proud of yourself for the life. I was standing here shaking in, in anticipation of a ton of notes to descend no. upon me. Just my congratulations Thank and applause. You. I leave you relieved. Thank you. <laughs> There's one other way in which irony may at first be at work where it doesn't seem to be. Mount Joy, the French herald, threatens King Henry V. Thus says my king. Say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but slumber. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at half lur, but that we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. Good. Do we now stop it there? That certainly goes with the way it's written. But now, let's try it in a different way, and suppose that Montjoy's out to humiliate Henry V in front of all his soldiers, and he does it with great gentleness and surface sympathy for Henry, as if he's saying, my dear old fellow, I'm terribly worried about you, I'm sorry for you, but I'm on your side. You're sending him up by doing that, but you're pretending to be on his side. Mm -hmm. Have a go. Okay, all right. Thus says my king. Say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but slumber. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at half lur, but that we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferings. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested, which in wait to re-answer, his pettiness would bow under. For our losses, his exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom, too faint a muster. And for our disgrace, his own person kneeling at our feet, but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this add defiance. And tell him, for conclusion, he hath betrayed his followers, whose condemnation is pronounced. So far my king and master, so much my office. This is a kind of irony, isn't it? But the technique is different. The mocking is inverted. It masquerades as sympathy. I think it's more devastating the way that Alan did it. That's great. Let's take another example of political irony and ambiguity. In Troilus and Cressida, 
the Trojan hero Hector meets Ulysses, the Greek politician. They like each other and are very courteous, but the courtesy is loaded and ironic. They're looking at the walls of Troy. I wonder now how yonder city stands, since we have here a base and pillar with us. I know your favor, Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, as many a Greek and Trojan dead, since first I saw yourself and Diomed in Ilion on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue. My prophecy is but half his journey yet. For yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. I must not believe you. There they stand yet. And modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all. And that old common arbitrator, time, will one day end it. So, to him we leave it. Good. Now, let's just sit down and talk about that a bit. I think that <clears throat> you would get the irony going further if you actually played the surface courtesy and chivalry more. I think it's also you quite... You were being a, a bit too beady. Yes, you were a bit too obviously beady. <laughs> but I think that you both play the political game of diplomatic courtesies on the surface. And also you've met before, so maybe you actually quite like each other. And you both respect each other. So there's a kind of umbilical cord of human friendliness. Because mm. they did actually try and stop it happening, didn't they? That's in right. In a way, in yes. the first meeting in, yes. that we don't see in the play. Yes. You went on an embassy to try to stop the war. Mm. And so you formed a little bond then, so you are together. But within that, the barbs will become more loaded. Mm -hmm. So like when you say base and pillar, as you did put that in inverted commas mm. then, if it seems courteous, it can also be more rude as well. It's a funny yeah. mixture of courtesy and rudeness from... Perhaps the answer is to just, initially, to just play the courtesy and see yeah, what happens. I think so. And then maybe the words will do yes. the irony for us. Yes. Let's, let's, let's do mm -hmm. it, just do it on the floor, perhaps, and just, oh. just do it for the courtesy, and then we'll do it another Great time. Great more Chinese. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder now how yonder city stands, since we have here a base and pillar with us. I know your favour, right. Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, there's many a Greek and Trojan dead, since first I saw yourself and Diomed in Ilion on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue. My prophecy is but half his journey yet, for yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. Oh, I must not believe you. There they stand yet. And modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all. And that old common arbitrator, time, will one day end it. So to him, we leave it. Well, that worked, didn't it? The irony did come out more through the courtesy, funnily enough. Of course, the so. irony, if we do it that way, the irony is a shared irony and not one that's against each other. That's we right. both know the score, we both know what's going to happen, we both know it isn't actually a thing, a scene of opposition at no, all. It's about two experienced men regretfully knowing what's going to happen. And I think that's excellent. Shared irony is a new kind of irony that we've found. I think um, that's great. There's also a third character in the scene, isn't there? And that's the city, yeah. which makes it possible for, not, for us not necessarily to be in contact, because mm. it's dangerous when you're playing the sort of game necessarily to confront each other. So there's always the city to bounce off. Mm. Um, that's true. As we play with each other. And there's old, there's old uh, Time as old well, time, who's the yes. fourth character yeah. in the Let's scene. talk about him. See, I think that... The irony goes on up to a point at which Hector breaks it 
after no, I must can't. not believe you. If you say to him very courteously, I don't believe a word you're saying, and then say with complete simplicity and romantic love of your city, there it is, that the non-ironic bit is the stronger off to the irony, and I thought you could make a bigger change there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes, yes. Um, and I think that you could help it by getting more irony into yon walls and yon towers yeah, and saying, yeah. oh, they're wonderful, they're splendid. Bonk. And yeah. then he can undercut it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certainly, we've got to find more out of our favourite word, time, haven't we? That old common arbitrator, time. Now, what does it mean? It means its literal sense, but it also means death to everybody, maybe mm. to one side, maybe to the other. Maybe it means something that you I mean, know that we are Troy's always doomed, mm. we're all equal. It's got to have, well, it's not irony, it's our other word in the programme, isn't it? It's ambiguity. Mm. Me, can I try something on it? Yeah. Let me do it when we do it. Yeah. OK, well, let's, let's try it again this time. Mm. Stand up on it. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder now how yonder city stands, since we have here her base and pillar by us. I know your favour, Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, there's many a Greek and Trojan dead, since first I saw yourself and Diomed in Ilion on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue. My prophecy is but half his journey yet. For yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. Oh, I must not believe you. There they stand yet. And modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all, and that old common arbitrator, time, will one day end it. So, to him we leave it. Well, I'd like to have one more go at it, because I know it's risky when one does something a number of times, one often does a bit better and a bit less well, but what you actually lost that time, though you gained on the points we'd worked on, well, was you well, lost the friendly courtesy you'd had on right, the floor. Right. You actually <laughs> were a bit uptight about well, it. Well, I was just standing up and sitting yeah, down. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, mm. a sitting down, easy feeling, and keep that umbilical cord between you. Right. Okay? I wonder now how yonder city stands, since we have here her base and pillar by us. I know your favour, Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, there's many a Greek and Trojan dead since first I saw yourself and Diomed in Ilion on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue. My prophecy is but half his journey yet. For yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. I must not believe you. There they stand yet. And modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all. And that old common arbitrator, time, will one day end it. So, to him we leave it. Good. I like that. So I think, so to him we leave it. <laughs> Good. Well, we've spent a whole programme on irony, not merely because it's important and difficult, but because it comes up in Shakespeare so often, and there's so much more of it than people ever realise. The strange thing is that I can actually think of no sustained long passage where Shakespeare gives irony to women. Odd moments, yes, but never for very long. The only bit I found suitable for our programme was a sonnet which, strictly speaking, should be spoken by a man, which is why we've only worked on men's speeches tonight. Perhaps that tells us something about Shakespeare, 
Or perhaps it tells us something about irony. Well, we've strayed into thorny areas. That is, as I've said, because we've moved from what is objective to what is subjective. Talking about irony has led us inexorably to talking about interpretation. In the remaining programs of this series, we shall go further that way. And as I said at the outset, we'll find there are very few rules, but a lot of questions.